and you're watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Next up, our Pathfinder special series on China-U.S. relations and many who have been contributing to the relations over the past four decades. The more aggressive the current U.S. administration takes up the mantle of protectionism, the bigger the strain on China-U.S. ties. The political uncertainty even spilled over to academic and people-to-people -people exchanges with a Trump executive order ending the Fulbright program in China. Similar programs like the Peace Corps also axed its China program earlier this year. And the latest news suggests that U.S. Secretary of State claimed President Trump is weighing restricting Chinese students from studying in the country, adding they are likely to announce the new actions against Beijing in the coming weeks or months. And threats like this are happening every day from Washington. Could relations get any worse between the two countries? I asked that question and many other more to David Lampton, one of the most respected voices on China from the U.S. He's also former president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. He was one of the earliest Fulbrighters to visit China. He said some of the U.S. decisions made recently are just the latest in an extended line of self-defeating moves that will weaken America's infrastructure of global cultural influence. Let's take a listen. Well, the Fulbright program, which was founded in 1947 in the United States, uh, the United States came out of World War II and wanted to build relations with as many nations as possible and thought American universities and professors and students both going abroad uh, to exchange knowledge and to bring foreign students, scholars, researchers, and language teachers to the United States would increase American soft power. But more than just soft power and international competition, uh, I think Americans believe, and I certainly believe, that uh, attracting the best brains in the world mm -hmm. helps American innovation and us to be a more productive society. So I would say the two big reasons are peace uh, and prosperity. Mm. Let's take a look at the numbers, because the numbers sometimes tell us a lot about the facts. Up to 390,000 Fulbrighters came from all over 160 countries and regions since the program began in 1947 in the United States. Records show of the total number of participants in 2017, 175 are from the Chinese mainland and 19 are from Hong Kong of China. And the number may not be high, but there is many other similar programs for exchanges. We have seen Peace Corps, for example. In the last 25 years, more than 1,300 American volunteers have completed their two-year assignments at more than 140 universities and colleges across China. Peter Hessler is only one of those examples, author of Rivertown, and Evan Osnos, an American journalist from The New Yorker, both joined this program. These are just the sporadic cases out of a huge group. Now, in China, Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University is operated a little differently in the class of uh, 2020, it has students from 38 countries with 40% from the United States, a fifth from China, 40% from the rest of the world. We also have the Yanjing scholars with the Peking University as well. Professor, what I want to say is, are we going to see a U.S. ever more withdrawing from its engagement, both with China and the rest of the world, and a China apparently very active to engage with the United States and also uh, the other countries? Well, uh, I think th I would answer your question by saying no, I do not think we will see that for a long period in the future. Mm. In other words, uh, the difficulties we're having now, I hope and I believe are going to be in retrospect, uh, unfortunate period, but not the main historical trend. But I would say something that's more important. Uh, it's one thing for me to say I'm optimistic or not. I'm optimistic about the future. But one strength I believe the United States has is not everything here depends on the central government. In fact, not everything depends on local government. And in the educational realm, it's a particularly decentralized situation here. 
So for example, the first time I went to do research for six months in China in 1982, I went to Wuhan, to Wuhan University, yes. which had a a school-to-school -school relationship with my university called Ohio State University. And as far as I would know, the federal, our net central government had virtually nothing to do with that. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of bilateral university-to-university -university, uh, uh, agreements. My own school of Johns Hopkins has had for 30 plus years a center that it, at Nanjing University that it runs in joint partnership, and I trust and hope it will be successful for another 30 years. Mm -hmm. Similarly, my school, SAIS, uh, Johns Hopkins here, has a program with Tsinghua in which SAIS students go to Tsinghua. Tsinghua students come to SAIS. They've been some of the best students uh, that both schools have. So I would say while the direction of what you might call federal policy, mm -hmm. our central government policy is very un, uh, unfortunate. I would say indeed reckless. Mercifully, the US doesn't depend entirely on its central government. And as long as American universities and other educational institutions see opportunities in China mm -hmm. to gain mutual benefit, they will continue unless the central government prohibits it. And uh, my guess is that the central government, short of conflict between our two nations, would not do that. A lot of people do not necessarily understand the significance of academic exchanges, the significance of uh, student exchanges um, and cultural exchanges. Maybe you could tell us about your personal story that would enlighten us about how we have managed after decades of efforts to be where we are today, at least between China and the United States. Professor, I know you were in Hong Kong and then on the mainland. Tell me more about that. Well, the uh, first time that I went to, we'll call it Greater China, was in 1972-73 as a Fulbright scholar, I went to Hong Kong to interview Chinese people, many of whom uh, during the Cultural Revolution uh, and earlier in uh, history had gone to Hong Kong. And American scholars such as myself could not go to China. It was prohibited by our government. My first passport had a list of prohibited countries, one of which was uh, the People's Republic of China. So the nearest I could get to China to study it and talk to Chinese people was in Hong Kong. I learned a lot. It was about, I did a study, it was my dissertation, became a book on the politics of medicine in China. Mm -hmm. And what I believed and what I believe now is, of course, it's important what our central leaders do, whether it's Donald Trump or President Xi or whatever. Central leaders matter. But when I went into the field, everybody was studying central leaders and central party meetings. And my view was that uh, how governments meet the basic needs of their people at the grassroots level is a very important part of politics. And therefore, I wanted to look how it was that a relatively poor China mm -hmm. in 1972, 73, was able to provide a much better level of public health for its people than many other country, developing countries at a similar income level. Mm. And China over time it did a very good job. And I wanted to tell the story about how China managed to have a better health circumstance than it had in many other regards. So I believe you need to walk on two intellectual legs. One is you need to understand the top of society, but you also need to understand where government meets society at the grassroots level. Mm. And the only place I could at that time really find out the kind of information and personal experience was by interviewing people in Hong Kong. Very interesting experience. And then a few years later, you struggled your way into China, the People's Republic of China, which you said, 
on the page of your passport was very long time being forbidden. 1976, Professor. I was uh, a part of a science group uh, that uh, was going to China to talk about steroid chemistry. Yeah. Steroid chemistry is, uh, has at that time had a lot to do with birth control pills and birth control policy. And I went with the National Academy of Sciences group because I was one of the few Americans who had looked at China's medical system as I just explained when I was in Hong Kong. Mm. So the National Academy, our National Academy of Sciences, asked me to join this group. Uh, and we went to China in 1976. But we had to enter China a month after Mao uh, had passed away. Uh, China at that particular time, and this always left a deep, uh, the transition to the next generation of leaders was not yet clear. And as we traveled around China from uh, Beijing down to Guilin to Shanghai, the new transition, new power structure gradually emerged. So I've always felt that I saw China firsthand. And I think that's one of the things that uh, I think young, maybe younger people in both of our countries uh, do not fully appreciate. And that is how expensive our conflict China and America's conflict were in the 1950s and 60s. Mm. And we've had 40 years of peace, rapid economic growth. Both of our countries have improved. And the long and the short of it is, is that engagement for both of our people has been a tremendous success. Uh, it's had problems all along. It has serious problems now. I think the worst problem since 1972. But our younger people ought to appreciate what the costs of bad U.S.-China relations can be. Enormous. Thank you, Professor, for sharing that part of the experience and your insight about history. But people could say, well, you know, Professor Lampton, those stories are old. Those stories are coming out of the time when China and the United States uh, were hand in hand, or at least in the process of coming hand in hand. Uh, but now, look at the situation has dramatically changed, and therefore your story does not provide any of the uh, reference to us anymore, some would argue, Professor Lampton. Well, I'm sure you're, you're correct, and young people always have the uh, sort of um, to come to terms with in what respect do we pay attention to the experience of our elders and to what extent do we look at a new situation with new means at our disposal and adapt to the new situation even if it isn't fully consistent with what an older generation might have done. I guess I call that the process of living. <laughs> but I think we all know that uh, there is some role for experience. Yeah. And I think anybody who has that response would just sim or who might think in the way you described should ask themselves, during the Cold War between the United States and China, where, from the United States point of view and from China's viewpoint, what were the two biggest wars of the Cold War? And the answer was Korea and Vietnam. And they both, both those wars involved China as well as, in the one case, Korea and the other, Vietnam. In the 40 years plus after normalization, we've had no wars or conflict. That doesn't mean we won't in the future. It doesn't mean that we don't have serious um, problems now, in which some people are very, um, I would say, immoderate about. But I think the idea that war is expensive is something that's become increasingly true. Mm. Uh, during the Cold War, we only had nuclear weapons, basically, and, and obviously conventional weapons. But now there are many other ways in which we each can hurt each other. Uh, we can disrupt each other's supply chains. We can in interrupt our educational relations. We can interrupt cyber connections upon which we're both so dependent. So I would say that my experience, yes, is old, but the wisdom of avoiding conflict is even more profound now 
perhaps than it was in the 1950s and 60s. You talk about the young people. I'm afraid that Professor Lampton, I have to remind you, many of those who are talking about this Cold War mentality are not necessarily young people inside the United States, but rather right. some of those policymakers in their uh, 70s and 60s. And some suggest that there is a danger of applying the Cold War mentality, particularly the playbook against the former Soviet Union now to China by the United States. What do you make of that discussion? Well, I, I agree with pretty much what you said, uh, and that is that no generalization is perfect. <laughs> and my uh, statement about younger people did not mean to apply to all younger people, because <laughs> young people have a variety of views in both our countries as well. And certainly, I would not suggest that older people can't have very counterproductive foreign policy views. I think if you look at the upper echelons of um, uh, uh, Washington, you'll find quite a few people my age with my color hair. Uh, and they're not all uh, pursuing a very wise course. And as you would say, have the Cold War playbook uh, firmly in mind. But I think you're going to see that the US is a resilient society. Winston Churchill had a, a statement, I think, about Americans. And of course, uh, Churchill had ties to the United States family ties. He says, you know, I love the Americans. They get, they are always right after they exhaust every other uh, possibility. Mm. In short, we're capable of making a lot of mistakes. And frankly, I would say China is too. Uh, and, uh, but we have corrective mechanisms. And I may be wrong, but I think you're going to see a very great display of a corrective mechanism on number, uh, November 3rd.